transnational agents um, operating across periods of great change and they leverage I think their personal displacements to forge creative expression and transformative connections particularly between the United States and Tanzania both Charlotte Hill O'Neill and Sam Joseph in Tira, I think deserve even more recognition than they get and I'm going to start with Charlotte because she's had such a direct influence on me so I'm going to share my screen now if that's okay um, let's see if I can pull this up and do shout out if you can't see the, the images properly um, but uh, for those of you that haven't heard of it before, Mama C has used her voice and her creative agency in pursuit of social justice and in celebration of African and African diasporic communities for over 50 years. She describes herself as a woman warrior of peace, which is an appropriate epithet for her courage, dedication and embracing optimism in pursuing a more equitable world through education, advocacy and the creative arts. She's a musician, poet, and visual artist, and she's performed and had residencies all over the world. She was born in 1951 and raised in Kansas City, and she became politically aware in her early teens, joining the Kansas City School of Human Dignity, age 17. And she, at that point, she started visiting local churches to speak about black history. She was an excellent student and won a college scholarship, but she ran away from home soon after graduating high school to start hanging out with the Black Panther community at the Panther Pad in the city. And it's here that she met Pete O'Neill when he came back from a speaking tour that had taken him all over the country. Pete was the chairman and founder of the Kansas City chapter of the Black Panther Party and very much an icon of the urban black revolutionary for younger Panther members. Pete's explained that he did not like Charlotte initially because she dared to speak back to him but within about three months, they were married. Their lives of political activism in Kansas City took a dramatic turn on October the 30th, 1969, when Pete was arrested for transporting a gun across state lines under a law that was implemented only two weeks earlier. He had the gun primarily to protect Charlotte, who was subjected to constant police harassment. Sentenced to a four year jail term, he was convinced he would be assassinated in prison as he, had, as he was such a high profile agitator. So they committed to a daring escape from the United States using fake passports in 1971. They went first to Sweden, spending six months in a community of political exiles near Stockholm before moving to Algeria in order to live alongside other Black Panthers, including Eldridge Cleaver, who'd set up an international headquarters for the movement there, encouraged by the Algerian president's support for activists engaged with decolonial efforts. Just a year later, in 1972, they decided to move yet again, arriving in Tanzania with only $700 to their name. And it's where they still live 50 years later. The decision to seek a new life in East Africa was motivated by the first president of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere's public support for political revolutionaries across the globe and by the fact that the country was home to the largest population of African Americans in East Africa at the time, estimated to be around 800. When they first arrived in Dar es Salaam, Charlotte was instantly exhilarated by life in this complex, vibrant city, but Pete was not so sure. Such was Charlotte's admiration for life in Dar that she tried hard to fit in as a purely African woman, in her words, wearing kanga in a traditional East African fashion, which is the photograph on the far left, I'm sure it's, sorry it's so grainy. But as she puts it in her most famous poem, I almost lost myself by trying to disavow her background growing up in the United States. Slowly, she managed to strike a balance and now sees herself as part of the global community of artists striving for social justice in its disparate forms. As Charlotte puts it, she belongs to the planet. After struggling to establish a livelihood in Dar es Salaam, the opportunity arose for the O'Neills to cultivate land near the northern city of Arusha. They were lent a modest area on the edge of a coffee plantation and they acquired goats and chickens and learned how to be farmers. And this was a very long way from their inner city American roots, but they embraced becoming self-sufficient homesteaders, so much so that Pete even learned how to build windmills to generate power. And then a chance came to buy land in the rural village of Imbasani, 
Nimbusani is near Mount Meru, which is the fifth highest mountain in, Af in Africa and about 60 miles from Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest of all. It's the heartland of the Wamaru people. And it's here that their dream of building not just a home and a farm, but also a centre to reignite their panther commitment to community service started to become real. Through exhausting physical labour, they cut out of the bush a remarkable complex, which is now called the United African Alliance Community Centre. As Pete's lawyer, Paul Magnarella puts it, they became African-American pioneers in their ancestral homeland. They had to learn how to make their own bricks and electrical wire and laid over a mile of pipe work as part of this effort. Then following a donation by another Black Panther called Geronimo Pratt, they hired a South African company to drill a well that was deep enough to serve the water needs of the entire village. Today, the UAACC is a non-profit NGO providing a diverse array of creative and educational programs for the local community. And the classes span English, computer skills, art, woodworking, clothing design, music, and audiovisual production. There's a wonderful recording studio on site called the Peace Power Production. All of these programs are offered for free. Excuse me offered for free and the centre also hosts regular poetry slams, dance performances and the annual Af African Liberation Day festivities for the area. And since 2008 it also incorporates an orphanage called the Leaders of Tomorrow programme and about 25 children live at the centre year round, many of whom are orphans or from families who are too poor to raise them. The UAACC also organises a free health clinic and they now have an ambulance to transport ill villagers to the local hospital. And in 2008, the same year, they trained local Tanzanian teams to install solar panels in 85 different village homes, none of which had previously had electricity. Last year, the centre created gallons of hand sanitizer and distributed, distributed masks to hundreds of people in Nimbusani as COVID-19 hit Tanzania like it did the rest of the world. And Peter's explicit that this work, as he puts it, our present day community outreach service, continues to be informed by our time as Black Panthers. Our work is truly a continuation of the work we did as members of the Black Panther Party. And murals like the one you can see on the screen are all over the centre's grounds. And part of this work involves hosting youth and student groups from all over the United States. And I've been lucky enough to take um, BSE students on three week study tours about six or seven times over the past decade or so. And you can see a couple of examples on the screen. Alongside learning about the visual cultures of East Africa, hiking on Kilimanjaro, spending time with the Maasai community and helping to teach English and computer skills in the classrooms, we've also contributed to the vibrant range of murals at the centre because art making I think is central to its environment as well as an important aspect of Mama C's own creative practice. On the left are some examples of her works at the centre. She's also produced concrete sculptures, acrylic paintings, papier-mâché and quilts that deliberately reference the importance of textiles in African-American traditions and her subject matter tends to focus on the economic empowerment of women and the importance of honouring ancestors. But she's probably most well known as, an, as a musician. She grew up around music. Her mother was an organist for the local church in Kansas City for about 30 years. And all of her aunts and sisters also sang in the Pentecostal church. But she is one of the first women ever to play two East African instruments that have been traditionally the preserve of men and taboo for women to practice. Both have either five or eight strings and are similar to, similar to lyres that were traditionally associated with hunting rituals. And these are the Obakano, traditionally played by the Gusi people, and the Nayatiti, which is associated with the group called the Luau. And she's incorporated these traditional East African instruments into her music that also draws on blues, gospel, jazz, and hip hop in compelling ways. And I want to share a short video with you now, if that's okay, because I think it's a particularly useful way of getting more of a sense of the community at the UAACC. It also adds to the story of her own family ancestry, gives you more of a sense of the artworks at the centre 
And you can also hear Mama Charlotte's voice directly rather than just having my translation of it. So I'm hoping this will work okay. Um, it's about eight minutes or so in length. So I had always heard on. and whispered conversations among my aunts and uncles and my cousins about one of our relatives, uh, uh, the brother of my grandfather, Grandfather Hill, who had escaped from Arkansas and went up to Kansas City because he had been accused of killing a white man. But I never knew his name. My second cousin, Eddie Jones's daughter, Tayana Jones, was doing a Black History class project. And one of the subjects was on the Elaine Massacre. She knew in her heart as soon as she saw the picture of Robert Lee Hill that that must have been the uncle who our family had always talked about in those whispered conversations. That uncle who had escaped with my grandfather and went to Kansas City. And when I saw the picture of my father, Sterling Hill, beside Robert Hill's photo, I knew that he was blood. I knew that the blood that I carry, the blood that screams for freedom, the blood that spreads love, the blood that, that that is really so similar to what my great uncle talked about when he formed the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America to try to gain rights for the sharecroppers and the money owed to them over the years. I knew that great uncle Robert Lee Hill had to have been the one who they always talked about. And now I know why the conversations were so whispered. It was because he had formed the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America, which became the catalyst of the Lane Massacre. And as I walked through our, our land here in Tanzania and, and I recall these conversations and I recall the fact that I carry his blood. I am so honored. I am so blessed to know this, that I am his great niece. Dare to struggle dare to win oh yes this is what one of our comrades emory douglas showed the young people who were with him in a workshop here unity peace and love respect this is what we teach by example here at UAACC. Use your voice, I can hear great uncle say. You have a voice, speak up. Don't be afraid to use it. And we make sure that we always have reverence for the memories of our ancestors. We make sure that black love is uppermost in our minds in our murals, in our hearts. Black love, a new mural by Brother Tim. And then when I think of the 52 years that me and him say, Brother Pete O'Neill, AKA Babu, have been together and serve as an example of black love serve as an example of unity and a revolutionary way of thinking, I feel covered in blessing. And here, my dad rests, right here in Embassy Village. When my father, Sterling Emmanuel Hill Sr., 
was in the process of making his transition into the realm of ancestors, I got this vision, and I was sharing this vision with him as he was passing on. And this vision was of so many of our matriarchs, of at least 30 of our matriarchs, the mothers, who had passed on in the Hill family. And they were singing, they were saying, we're ready to receive you, Stowe. Come on home, come on home. And I was sharing this with Dad and, and telling him, don't be afraid to make that transition. And so after he had passed on, I sat down and did this uh, painting, which is symbolic of the vision that I had, the matriarchs at the water in the realm of the ancestors. And as you can see, they're all singing, welcome, we're waiting for you. So all these matriarchs are singing, welcome home soon. We got the gates open for the voice of an There's something about those instruments and that music that brings my ancestors' voices to me. And then we come to our ancestor wall, and these are some of Brother Pete's uh, relatives, his mother and father, his grandparents, and his daughter Kathy. And these are some of my ancestors, Sterling E. Hill, Teresa Calzada Garrett, who was my mother, Lee Dove Hill, who was the brother of, of great uncle Robert Lee Hill and Esther and Elmer Garrett. We give the visitors and our family opportunities to sign this wall, to sign the ancestors that they want to remember. And today, I will sign my great uncle, Robert Lee Hill's name on this ancestor wall. Uh, stop that here. I hope you could all hear that okay. It's um, rather just for reasons of time, we won't um, hear quite the end of it there. But it is an extraordinary connection, the family connection she has with the Elaine massacre specifically. Um, and if you're interested, I can send you a few links more about the, th that story and about Robert Lee Hill in particular. But I wanted to press on just for reasons of time. Um, so just to go back to my slideshow there, and just to say that um, Pete still cannot come back to the United States. He would be arrested immediately if he did even though there is a long running campaign to get him a presidential pardon. But as I know, you know, already Charlotte does travel regularly back to the United States on her annual Heal the Community tours, spreading her messages of peace, love and global creativity all over the country. And we've organised a number of events with her over the past few years at Bridgewater. Here's just a few posters of them. The most recent one, which I know Kelly is familiar with, was for International Education Week in November when we premiered this film. Nayatiti Medicine, which is raising awareness of obstetric fistula. All of the actors were from the local village in Imbasani. And I do think Mama C is amazing at building communities as well as healing them. And she has changed many people's assumptions about the Black Panthers on both sides of the Atlantic. Both she and Pete 
have come to the conclusion that the work that they've achieved since moving to Tanzania would not have been possible had they stayed in the United States. It was the displacement that forced them to learn so many new skills and the rekindling of their political principles in the foothills of Mount Meru is such a compelling story of perseverance and creative ingenuity that, in, that it has inspired so many people to learn about the Black Panthers who I don't think would have done otherwise. Their work has helped to shift the narrative framing of the movement away from a fixation on armed confrontation and violence towards the more central armatures of service, education, mutual responsibility and communal uplift. And I think Charlotte has the ability to communicate with the local Wamaru population just as much as she can the African-American youth in cities like Kansas City and Boston, as well as musicians, activists, students and academics from all over the world. I'm not sure she would describe herself as a diplomat, and certainly this term should not obscure a fierce and direct confrontation of injustice whenever she sees it, but I do think her poetry, music, visual art and performances build bridges and cool division. She is a revolutionary, but her endeavours are rooted in respect for everyone, and I think that's something she shares with Brother Pete, and I'm very grateful to be their friend. And this brings me to the second figure I'd like to share with you today, a figure I think that's even less well known uh, than Mama Charlotte, Sam Joseph Intero. He is cited on literature of, on African modernism, but there's only a single article written on him. And I believe the story of modern African art and its global engagements cannot be written without greater understanding of the various stages of his career particularly given the dramatic diplomatic posts he ends up holding alongside his teaching career. He was born on April the 20th, 1923, into a Chaga community in Mashame, which is on the southwestern slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. You can just see it here on the map. That's about 60 miles from where the UAACC is today. He was the eldest of eight children to, born to a coffee farmer and he attended the local primary school run by Lutheran priests who had established missions on the mountain in the 1890s. And then he attended the local government run school, which is about 20 miles away from his Chaga homestead. But he must have been a gifted pupil, as despite this pretty humble background, he then left to study at the most important higher education institution in East Africa, Makrere University in Kampala in Uganda, from 1944 to 1947. And it was here that he took his first ever art classes under the tutelage of the British um, expatriate Margaret Trowell, who'd established the art school there. Intero was employed to teach painting himself after he graduated. And in 1949, eight of his works were included in an exhibition in London where they were praised for their deep feeling, strength and rhythm. As a result of this, in 18, October 1952, he was awarded a Colonial Development and Welfare Scholarship to study at the prestigious Slade School of Fine Arts at the University of London in the United Kingdom, which is where I did my doctoral work. The annual class photos that I've discovered during his time there, I think are very striking. You can see interior here, uh, just, to, just to the right of centre. And they're striking because he is the only person of colour in the 1953 group and one of just two in 1954 and 1955. And I think those class photos vividly demonstrate just how unusual his trajectory was from rural East Africa to metropolitan London in this period. He also became actively engaged in student politics, serving as the university college students uh, treasurer and also on the Slate Student Society. And whilst he was there, he also wrote an important book in Swahili on the history of the Chaga. Sharing the story of his cultural group remained a priority, I think, for the rest of his life. And it's poignant because until his retirement in the late 1980s, he never lived there again. He was, in a sense, displaced for about 40 odd years. In Intero's account, the Chaga moved to Kilimanjaro, partly to escape the harassment of the Maasai, seeking protection on its slopes. Once there, they discovered a moderate climate and very rich soils suitable for grazing cattle at the lower levels and cultivating bananas and, and maize higher up. The majority of his paintings 
depict Chagas scenes. Here are some good examples, and all of these are from the 1950s and 1960s. As he explained, my painting is about life, tradition, the customs, and the day-to-day -day activities of my people on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. My home is about 6,000 feet high. The best way to have a full understanding of my art is to pay a visit to my country and meet the Chaga, who are energetic, friendly, and hardworking. But I think the assumption by some critics that he created a timeless, romanticised vision of Chaga culture is a fallacy. Paintings like these have been cited as evidence of his willingness to offer European and American audiences quaint and comforting images of a coeval Africa. But I think these works are far more complex than this, balancing signifiers of change, modernity, and the legacies of colonialization, alongside the maintenance of traditional community co cooperation and rural ways of life. Scenes of intense cultivation of mountainsides do resonate as ciphers of Chaga cultural pride, but crops like cotton and coffee, which is what you can see uh, being harvested here, are difficult to disconnect from the impact of German and British colonialism, since both of those were introduced to the region in the 1890s by European administrators keen to economically exploit the soils of Kilimanjaro. Meanwhile, quarrying is a recurring subject in his career, and I think it's hard to think of a landscape theme less suitable for the projection of an unchanging rural romanticism. Alongside quarries, there are many depictions of road building, and whilst these routes are powered by human exertion with traditional tools, the sense of opening up new pathways for progress and change remains, particularly given the mechanistic rhythms of the labouring bodies. For me, these are images that strike a compromise between cherished nostalgic memories of traditional ways of life and a vitalised acknowledgement of change. And there are many works that I've discovered that also focus on processes of urbanisation, particularly during his time in Kampala. I think that in Intero's paintings, when you look at them across four decades of work, there are a series of negotiations and balances that encode the complexities of Tanzanian, Tanzanian identity, spanning colonial and post-colonial, independence and post-independence, geographical and ideological terrains. These are deceptively stable images, particularly given the fact that they were circulating across three continents, mediating mediating expectations of very different audiences, spanning a period of unprecedented political change. That balancing of signifiers, I'm suggesting, I think is visible in the promotion of Sam Intero in the publicity photographs for his one-man show at the Merton Simpson Gallery in New York in 1960. And this was a landmark event for an East African artist, the first time an American gallery had ever shown uh, um, an exhibition of a single living African artist. We see him here standing in a dark, indeterminate space, and the photographer has experimented with various body positions that you can see on the left. For example, intently at work on the painting and a loose-fitting workman-like smock. Standing side-on, regarding the picture on the easel, dressed in a fashionable suit that betrays no evidence that he's the maker turned three quarters view that highlights his assertive broad-shouldered profile filling out the fashionably tailored suit the very epitome of a successful modern african man of the world the image chosen for the front cover which you can see on the right um, the front cover of the catalogue that is is a rather awkward fusion i think where the smock is worn on top of a still visible white collar and tie with intero confidently looking out of the picture space but with the conceit that he is still in the process of painting the image of village huts. The spray of brushes in his left hand points at the easel, but it also points out of the interior space in which it's placed. Now this exhibition was a result of Intero securing a Carnegie Corporation grant to undertake a 10 week study tour of the United States, visiting New York, Boston, Washington DC, Chicago, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Toledo and Buffalo, and this in turn brought him into contact with the Harmon Foundation. 
founded by wealthy Jewish businessman William Harmon in 1925, this philanthropic body is best known probably today for its support of African-American artists during the Harlem Renaissance. But it also offered scholarships and exhibitions in the United States to over 300 African artists between 1947 and 1968 under the leadership of Mary Beattie Brady and Evelyn Brown. These efforts were rooted in a belief in the importance of intercultural exchange and of art's role in fostering peace. As Brown wrote, its programmes were determined to make friends with those coming forward into freedom and self-determination. And it was the Harmon Foundation that arranged for this show at the Merton Simpson Gallery, a space owned by the most prominent black abstract expressionist, who was also a member of the Spiral Group and a dealer in traditional African art. Following this 1960 exhibition, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, or MoMA, bought the painting you can see on the left, making Interior the first ever African artist to have a work purchased by a major American institution. It was exhibited at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. in 1962, and it's striking to see it hanging alongside Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World and Picasso's Girl Before a Mirror at MoMA's exhibition uh, in 1964 called Art in a Changing World. And this is um, Interior's work is on the right hand side here. Other Interior paintings entered American collections at the same time, including works bought by Governor Rockefeller and the Chase Manhattan Bank. And he continued to travel to the United States, such as in 1961, where he attended a six week program at BU, concerned with teacher training and curriculum development for new emerging nations. Clearly, his stature benefited greatly from such exposure, and between his graduation from the Slade School in 1955 and 1961, he went back to McCrary and was clearly being groomed as Margaret Trowell's replacement as the head of the art school. And it was during this time that he made a series of seven really extraordinary 25 foot murals at Macarere, which I was lucky enough to visit in 2017. Sadly, they've deteriorated pretty badly, but they still remain a dramatic evocation of the vertical nature of Chaga life on Kilimanjaro. And it's the location and timing of these murals that's significant, I think, given the fact that McCrary was fostering some of the most important intellectuals, writers and politicians who would imminently be driving the independence movements in Southern Africa. They were painted in 1959 in the dining room of Northcote Residence Hall, which the famous East African writer Ngugi Wa Thiongo has noted was a multi-purpose space for daily eating, a dance arena for socials and an art gallery. To live in Northcote was to be part of something bigger than yourself. Victory and loss, triumph and disaster engendered a common sense of grief or joy. And those are Ngugi's words. Figures like Ngugi and Benjamin Mkapa imagined emancipation and the end of colonialism whilst eating, dancing and talking. Beneath these works are the precipice of seismic change. And astonishingly, virtually simultaneous with these Macarere works, Intero was also commissioned to create these paintings for the Commonwealth Institute in, uh, new building in London in England, which had opened in 1962. In other words, Intero's murals honouring Chaga life were concurrently providing the backdrop for intellectual ferment about the end of colonialism at institutions thousands of miles apart on both sides of the political and diplomatic struggle. And sadly, the works you can see here um, have, have, have gone missing uh, since the 1980s. It was at this point that Interior was appointed the first Tanganyikan High Commissioner to the United Kingdom between 1961 and 1964. And the selection of an artist to such a senior diplomatic post on the eve of Tanganyika's independence from Britain, I think is very striking. Tanganyika gained independence on the 9th of December 1961, it became Tanzania in 1964 when the mainland entered into union with the island of Zanzibar. Intero by this time had married Evangeline Sarah Nindowa, who was also a student of Makarere, who went on to study at St Anne's College in Oxford, becoming the first African woman to ever graduate from Oxford University. She became a member of the Ugandan Legislative Council in 1958 and was an important educator and advocate for women's rights. Together, Sam and Sarah 
were an educated cosmopolitan and articulate couple well suited to promoting the newly independent nation. But Interior's diplomatic posting also coincided with the escalation of the Cold War, of course, and he became involved in very tense political work. For example, on September the 16th, 1963, he had to ratify an anti-nuclear weapon testing treaty on behalf of East Africa, and he's interviewed in a variety of newspapers on January the 20th, 1964, including American newspapers, about Nurere's suppression of the, of the mutiny in the Tanganyikan military. And when he returned to Tanzania in 1964, he was retained by Nurere's government and was tasked with simultaneously refashioning the foreign service and developing the cultural infrastructure of the newly independent country. Yet despite this heavy workload, he traveled again to the United States in June of that same year to attend the first World Congress of Craftsmen at Columbia University on the invitation of the American Craftsmen's Council. After participating in various panels, he was elected the inaugural General Secretary of this new UNESCO affiliated World Craft Council. And you can see the uh, image on the right hand side to reflect that. Part of this work involved giving lectures in London, Kampala and Nairobi that demonstrate his commitment to establishing a history of art for East Africa. In 1963, he gave a particularly noteworthy lecture in London about um, ancient Tanzanian rock art from the Kondoa district. And it's tempting to see in his own painted figures an echo of the swaying silhouetted forms that bend in rhythmic lines in the rock art. And I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that to show you. But I think Intero self-identified as a caretaker of Tanzanian cultural heritage, tasked with mediating the impact of modernity. That role becomes even more prominent when he becomes Tanzania's first ever commissioner of culture from 1967 to 1973, which I don't really have time to discuss now, as his responsibilities covered not, over the, not only the visual arts, but also sports, the national museums, and the promotion of Kiswahili as the national language. What is clear is that he used his political service to culturally mediate both sides of the Cold War, since he orchestrated exhibitions that were open almost concurrently in Munich, New York and Moscow between 1969 and 1970. He also led the Tanzanian delegation to the Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers in 1969, giving a talk entitled The Artist at Home and Abroad. And he declared in this that artists are the ones that pace cultural progress, interpret the life of their people and forecast the development of their futures. If our culture is to grow healthily, it should seek inspirations from other forms of culture, but without being swamped by those foreign forms. However, the question of the degree to which his own artworks were embroiled in Cold War negotiations and engagements is a complex issue. Whether his paintings should be interpreted as direct depictions of Nerere's socialist policies, especially the notorious villagization program following the Arusha Declaration of 1967, is hard to be sure of. Angelo Kakande has argued that Nerere's scenes should be read as explicitly promoting the tenets of socialism as a form of good governance. But I think that interpretation is difficult to sustain, given the fact that Intero's works of collectivized Chaga life proceed by at least a decade, Nerere's presidency, and the advent of explicitly socialist policies in Tanzania. What I think is more fruitful to see in them is a strategic pragmatism that balances the ideological uh, complexities of Nerere's government when forging sovereignty and a visible national identity in this period. We should remember that, as Kate Croucher has put it, at the dawn of the colonial age of liberation, knowledge about the continent of Africa has become distinctly hot property. But what kind of knowledge about Africa do these images of Chaga life offer exactly? This question takes on particular significance given the prominence of Mount Kilimanjaro in the global imaginings of Africa. The so-called rooftop of Africa has been steeped in legends for his uh, sorry in legend for centuries and was entangled in this period particularly with the burgeoning mountaineering industry and the fame of Ernest Hemingway's tales 
set in the East African savannah, especially his short story, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, which was written in 1936, but republished in 1961. Kilimanjaro also featured prominently in resonant acts of political sovereignty at the time, including the lighting of the Uhuru torch on the summit in 1961 in December to symbolize the bringing of freedom to the region. Intero's paintings contain many signifiers of life on the mountain, such as the innovative irrigation systems, the communal labor, marriage customs, and the centrality of coffee and bananas to its economies. But I think these images remain tantalizingly oblique. And it's interesting that he never depicts the mountain's peak until the 1980s. There is never the sense that the Chaga lives represented are being lived for our benefit as viewers. These scenes are self-contained and any sense of residual colonial mastery is resolutely denied. His concern for compositional rhythm makes the figures become so much a part of their surrounding landscapes that the lush terrain acts as a barrier screening our visual access and protecting the lives from too penetrating a surveillance. Knowledge as a result remains elusive. We must rely just on painted glimpses that Intero puts into global circulation and his own written explanations of Chaga life. And I think this is entirely deliberate. Intero was surely aware that to quote Croucher again, art historical scholarship on African culture boomed in the era of geopolitical hostility and grew specifically within the ideological competitive climate of colonial independence. As an artist and a statesman, Intero wasn't just a pawn in a wider strategic battle, but rather he was an active agent, who I think mediated Tanzania's sensitive position as one of the most well-known African countries pursuing socialist policies and welcoming revolutionaries from around the world, whilst at the same time benefiting from American support and exchange, something he experienced personally, as I've already outlined. And Chaga life is particularly interesting from the perspective of the struggle between communism and capitalism, since Intero's depiction of it can be read as containing strong socialist implications, as Angelique Kukandi has argued. But at the same time, the Chaga were construed by international observers and other cultural groups in East Africa as unusually entrepreneurial and in tune with modern capitalist markets because of their prominence at the centre of the coffee industry. Intero's works can thus be seen to appeal to different audiences with divergent ideological agendas, and he was a skillful enough diplomat to facilitate that multivalence. Throughout these decades, he remained engaged in artistic exchange with the United States. He received a Fulbright visiting scholarship to spend a year at Dillard University in 1977 and exhibited new works in a solo show called living in Tanzania at the Nexus Gallery in New Orleans. And in the exhibition catalogue, the curator Vernon Winslow wrote evocatively that while much has been said about the new surge of African political movements, we've not had the opportunity to receive enough information concerning the lifestyle of the villages themselves. We sense that Intero is presenting us with a narrative filled with sturdy truths and at the same time suggesting that we look beyond the enchantment of the paintings. Peering beneath the ochre coloured attraction of moving forms and linear rhythms, we soon find ourselves facing the poetic expression of a unification of social forces, forces which we have not yet unified even here in many of our own American cities. Intero also enjoyed a residency at the University of Wisconsin in Madison on their visiting artist program in 1983. And during these trips, he was interviewed for oral history projects and demonstrated a particular interest in historically black institutions, affirming, I think, his engagement with diasporic African communities in the United States. Taken as a whole, his periods in the US are testament to his pioneering role in introducing modern African art to American audiences during the critical first decades of the independence era. And I know we're nearly out of time, but just very quickly, these periods of transatlantic exchange also overlap with a series of public commissions he worked for um, in Tanzania 
whilst employed at the University of Dar es Salaam. His works are all over Tanzania, adorning national monuments, regional headquarters of the CCM party, the Kariaku Market Corporation, the Institute of Finance, three banks, so, sorry, three branches of the Bank of Tanzania, and the postal and telecommunication headquarters in Dar es Salaam. Most of these works are often made of coloured stone chippings, and sadly they're in a state of grave neglect today, as you can see in these photographs I took in 2017. Many of them have themes of progress and development. At the top, for instance, the panels tell us the story or the history of the postal service in East Africa. And I think the pressures of holding in balance signifiers of tradition and modernity, nostalgia and progress, political ideology, and transnational pragmatism is still present in them. For example, in this scene of Kilimanjaro that he does for the National um, Air Corporation, there are subtle signs of railway tracks to the left of the foreground figure um, in this otherwise bucolic landscape. But the strain of incorporating fantasies taking in Icarus and a fleet of the latest passenger jets, jets in this timeline of aviation at a moment when virtually no one in Tanzania could afford to fly and the economy and the Ujama dreams were collapsing are difficult for the painted spaces to accommodate in the confident rhythms that you see in his earlier mural works. But this is not to suggest that these works aren't important historically, for I think they cast light backwards onto his earlier periods and the latent pressures within. I hope they survive long enough for new generations to see and reflect on. And interestingly, the work of Intero and Mama Charlotte directly overlap in this important landmark in Arusha, which is a monument Intero helped to design in 1971 to celebrate the 10th anniversary of independence. The concrete reliefs um, that he made were falling apart, so Charlotte helped to organise a project to restore them in 2001. And although this was somewhat controversial, her work repairing Intero's designs is testament to her belief in the importance of public service and the role of art in honouring the past and building community, both in Africa and the African diaspora. And I'd like to end by sharing that with the help of a Chaga friend called Gabby Mze, um, I've just recently been able to find Intero's final resting place. The fact that the location of his grave was not previously known is indicative of the neglect his legacy has suffered since his death in 1993. And it's moving, I think, that the family plot that you see here is in a banana grove in accordance with Chaga tradition. This is 6,000 feet up on Mount Kilimanjaro. Thank you. So I'm sorry I went on so long. <laughs> But, um, no, think, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was super enriching, very interesting and engaging. Um, we do have a couple minutes if anyone has a brief question or something they would like to ask. Um, so, yeah. I'd be very interested, John, in knowing your experience as you entered into this community, as you first engaged, um, and and also what kind of checks you have to run on your own perception of the work? Right. Well, that's a good question. I think, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, the, because it's uh, not your, it's not your space really. I mean, no, no, absolutely. that way. So yeah. how do you, um, how do you balance that? Well, I think, I mean, the question about who has the, you know, who should be writing about these or commenting them is a, is a, is an important question. I think what I was trying to do in the lecture is, I think when you look at him from a, the perspective that these were made for audiences all over the world, almost from the very beginning, you know, his first show really is in London in 1949. So um, although clearly as the works develop, they are for Tanzanian audiences, as I said, all over the major cities, I think almost from the very beginning, he saw himself as a, as a transnational artist, really, and actually very much engaged with speaking and making artworks that were for audiences both in America and in and in Europe as well so in that sense I think it's um, a more useful way of thinking thinking of the works really rather than seeing them as a as a Tanzanian artist who um, sort of subsequently becomes in you know sort of shown in other parts of the world that global engagement was there almost from the very beginning as I said within 
what sort of three years of his first ever art class he's having shows internationally and I think that's one of the reasons I think it's it's okay for other people to speak about him from other parts of the world to, if that's partly what you were addressing there and I think the reality is no one else has been doing this sadly I did speak to a lot of people in Tanzania including friends of his I've tracked down um his godfather and, and his daughter and so on but sadly as you can see the works themselves are quite literally falling apart off the buildings which is such a such a pity so I think there's a real urgency to not just record them but to actually think about them as well um, and there is some work um, going on there's a show um, that's opening in Fisk uh, um, in in Tennessee in Nashville um, at the end of this year which is all about African modernism in the United States is the first time there's ever been a show dedicated to that and there will be hopefully at least one interior work in that so I think there is increasingly an interest in looking at these relationships the reality is most of the famous modern African artists that we know of were being supported by groups like the Harmon Foundation in particular I mean it's an amazing number 300 African artists were either given shows or um you know, given major financial support by that one foundation. It's, and then actually, when you look at the roll call of names, it's literally a who's who of famous modern African artists. So to see, you know, to think about what that relationship does to the artworks and the kind of audiences that those artworks are for, I think is, is important. And I think it changes a little bit the way we would otherwise um, write about them. And, and, and in a sense, who, who does write about them too. There's a real, it's interesting talking to local artists there too, because I've spoken to a lot about Intero and whether they see him as this great father figure, as a pioneer. And there's really, although there's an acknowledgement that he was important, there's very little engagement with him, um, which is interesting. And I'm still, still sort of trying to reflect on why that might be the case. He's not really revered generally. I mean, he's written into the school textbooks and so on, but um, as I said, the fact that no one knew where his um, burial plot was, where his house on the mountain was, these kinds of things is a real reflection. I mean, it took three weeks to find to find that, that find his house, and I've got very moving photographs of how dilapidated it is. So, you know, at the moment, at least, there isn't really this work um, um, being done. I think it's partly because of the entanglements with you i'm sorry this is a long answer to your question but the entanglements to no them. that's it's um because he's so in, in in sort of ingrained with that socialist period with the ujama period in particular and because that sadly ended in in disastrous economic consequences even though there's it's complicated why that's the case i think in tanzania it's still quite a painful thing to to think and reflect on and i think a lot of artists there young artists in particular don't really look to that time period particularly for inspiration that the the ambition is still to engage sort of beyond the country um and to look at sort of i suppose what we might think of as more capitalist kind of gallery systems and so on so i think that's partly why he doesn't uh, get as much attention as he might do otherwise um, and I think it's a real pity because I think the works are amazing and also just as, as I hope you can see the just the sheer range of positions that he held the, the, you know absolutely at the epicenter of some really crucial diplomatic discussions throughout for a long period of time I think is really unusual for an artist and I think it's, it's just a fascinating story as much as anything else so I think although I wouldn't want to reduce the works to this sort of narrative of, of diplomacy at the same time they're clearly caught up in it in various ways and I think that's a story that you can only really tell from multiple perspectives from a European and American as well as an East African perspective so uh, yeah I hope that I hope that answers the question um, uh, well it pops another question I don't want to take from everyone else uh, but uh, has, is the story of this foundation available well, the Harmon Foundation is quite well known, relatively speaking. Yeah, so there is some literature on it. As I said, really because it's um, it's so influential. For them. A, there is as a position of of being an agent of change. Yeah, well, and I think for them. Well, I hope again there is um, a lot of research on them at the moment. There's some new okay. books coming. Yeah, and I, there are, I think there has been some quite good studies on their significance for, as I said, particularly for the Harlem Renaissance for a lot of African American artists. So again, it's an incredible list of people that they were supporting. Um, they also built, I mean, amazing stories of them building, I think he actually started William Harmon with building um, playgrounds in Harlem. That's the first thing he, that he, all, almost all the playgrounds that you still see in Harlem today were built by him, provided by the money. And he could, he gave interest-free loans to lots of people in Harlem as well. That's how it started. And then it became more focused on the arts after that. Um, so there is, I think people are, 
aware of, of its significance. It's slightly controversial, I think, my understanding of it in certain circles, because sometimes it seems to be a little bit too... Um, it's sort of attitude towards African-American artists is it, it's complicated at times, I think. So although the support was there, I think some people find it uh, slightly distasteful at certain points. Um, but at the, at the same time, I think there's a real acknowledgement that, again, the story of African-American art, as well as modern African art, you can't really tell it without without acknowledging just how significant it was. I mean, it's a you know, 20 year period where... Um, at least from my my understanding, virtually every major, literally every major show in the United States they were involved in. It was an incredible number of artists that they were they were actively supporting. So, um, so yeah, thankfully that story. And there there are some. There has been an exhibition or two about the Harlem Foundation artists more generally. So, um, but I agree with you. It deserves a lot more attention. Um, yeah. I know it is 501. Is there any last minute questions anyone may have? Any comments, anything? No? Well, thank you everyone for attending and thank you most of all, Dr. Sherlin. This was so yeah. enriching, very interesting, especially during Black History Month and especially because obviously like there's not a lot, I know we had said it in emails, but there's not a lot of like funding for cultural programs. So to be able to do this is very awesome. Um, and yeah, equally as enjoyable as your classes, if not more so very <laughs> engaging. So thank you so much. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. And thank you all for coming as well. It's been, it's always a pleasure to share these stories. So yeah. thank you again. So let, let's all get a bit of sunshine whilst we can before the snow yeah. comes. <laughs> yeah.